Hey, thanks everyone. You're listening to Shiny Side Out with Dave. And Mackie. We're coming to you live, live, live from the Sydney studios where one piece of the informational puzzle on Revolution Radio on freedomsips.com. You can collaborate with us in the chat room while we're on air. Uh, you can also, and I suggest this heavily, follow us on Twitter, YouTube and Facebook to get updates between shows and check out our website for featured guests, previous show notes, and if you missed out during the show, you can access all the links we paste into the chat. Of course, if you listen to this on YouTube in the, in the future, we're coming to you from the past. Um, hey, uh, also, I'd like to say that um, you can now listen to us on TuneIn.com. You've got TalkStreamLive.com as well. And uh, if you buy yourself a Grace Tabletop Radio, you can listen to us as well. Hey, so we've expanded our brand, have we? Oh, yeah. And nice. uh, a larger listening audience, man. It's just absolutely awesome. Um, uh, also, um, if you're in the States, although, you know, we, we pack a lot into the show, so uh, if you're in the States, you can call in on... <laughs> Three four seven six double eight two nine zero two, or you can add Freedom Screen to Skype, and you can call us that way. And good uh, luck with that. <laughs> 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 I don't think I think we have a uh, call inner, caller inner for like forty shows. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. You know, it's all good. Hey, um, this is show number fifty. Fifty five zero. Die and jubilee. Boom. Yeah, awesome. And we're. After tonight, it'll be two more shows, and we'll be have been done this for a year. And I think that's just—I never knew that we'd be where we are. Uh, still, hats off to Hawk and all the work he does. And you know, please um, donate, donate, donate. And just on that, Dave, I don't know where you are. I'm still sitting in the same chair I started in. So I don't know. Got a new chair. <laughs> I have the same chair here. But no, seriously, though, thanks, Night Hawk and all the other hosts on the Revolution Radio, and, and, and not just the hosts, but the producers and all the people that keep the servers running. Thank you very much uh, for making it possible for Dave and I to spin our own specific brand of crazy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guess what? I was at, a, at our 30th school reunion last night. Um, it was an extended reunion, and I and I ran into a guy who's published a um, an apocalyptic, um, you know, end of the world scenario book, and we'll be having him on the show, no doubt, coming up. Um, but, but all these people have been following me on Facebook. I haven't seen for uh, you know years. How many mm, years? And they said, um, I said, oh, so, so what have you been doing? I said, I got I get a radio show. Said, yeah, I know, I heard it. It's like what? And then they started to ask me questions about all the, all the stuff, and it was really cool. Um, I didn't expect the, the night to go that way, but, you know, that was pretty cool. Um, there was a guy, you know, that, that, that we talked about Bigfoot and UFOs and, you know, the end of the world and the, uh, asteroids. Uh, you name it, we talked about it. And it was, it was a lot of fun, and I didn't think these people thought this way. I think it's our this generation. These people. <laughs> and when I say these people, these are the people I went to school with. I'm with you. I'm right? I didn't think, uh, you know, you don't think that other people are going to think the same way. But I did run into one of the guys. I won't say his name. He, he works as uh, a, a military guy. And I, don't, I didn't turn him around, but I just raised one question. He said, there's no way that so many people could cover something up. And I said, look, just pretend you and I were in the military and I was told my, by my boss not to tell you that I was working on something top secret. I'm not going to tell you, am I? And he went, fair call. <laughs> no, he's right. Look, you're right, I should say. Do you know what I mean? And people, yeah, you look, and this is, I just have to, sorry, I have to give my two cents here. It is very easy to keep a secret. In fact, it is easier if you give... 50, 60, 70 percent of the truth, which I think is what we're faced with here, right? Mm -hmm. And and because of the pyramidal stru pyramidal structure of, of our society, you know, like it looks like a pyramid. A uh, few on the top know everything, and the vast majority at the bottom knows nothing. That's how everything in our society is organized: companies, clubs, uh, corporations, governments, anything, right? So I think it is very, very easy for the few that know a lot or everything uh, to control the information that goes to the rest. And guess what? If information does get out that shouldn't have, um, it is very quickly either discredited or the person has gotten rid of or all traces, if it hasn't propagated too far off, that particular piece of information will disappear. So uh, it, is, it is not that hard. And people say, oh, you can't keep a secret. Yes, you can. 
you can in fact keep a secret rather well, especially under uh, the pain of death, uh, which is what we're facing. That's been the threat. A lot of people who have been having, you know, kept secrets. And I, look, one, the best case that I brought up just for him, because um, <laughs> I know when you're, when you're talking to a, someone from the military who doesn't believe in any conspiracies at all, he just laughed it away. And I said, you know what? Um, he goes, okay, you just tell me one thing, the moon. Don't tell me we didn't go there. I just say, I'm not going to tell you that. I, I know we went there. We have put reflectors on there. We can, we can reflect lasers off. Mm-hmm. We went there. Yep. I said, I don't believe the footage that we saw was reminiscent of that was, that was from the moon. And in, in fact, the Hasselblad camera manufacturer recommended that they shield the cameras, in which they didn't, and return them back because the Van Allen belt radiation would basically overwash all of the, the imagery that they would ha- happen to take. Now, and the funny thing is, now they're releasing uh, images from the same place, the moon, from the same missions, the first lot of missions, that are now in super high definition. We didn't even have cameras that did that then, right? This is oh. the 60s. Right? You're, so, you're a naysayer. <laughs> oh, I know. And, and anyway, so, so what I said to him was, um, said, d- despite, despite all, all of that, you know, I said, I, I worked on, on something I can't talk about. And he goes, what? And I said, I can't tell you. I said, that's how easy it is to keep a secret. Mm-hmm. So, so just, just go with it, believe that secrets exist. And I said, is there any government in the world that you don't trust? And he goes, no. And I said, so you believe that America's government tells the truth about everything? And he goes, well, yeah. I said, JFK assassination. And he goes, oh, well, yeah, we all know there was two bullets. But I said, that's not what the findings brought out in a, in a court of law. They said there was the magic bullet, which was all impossible. Yeah, it went backwards and on itself. <laughs> exactly. And I said, if you believe the court system brought out all the information, then you, I, I, I can't help you, right? And he said, you know, fair call. It's all good. You know, I'm, I'm with you on it now. I, I didn't think, I, I think I turned around a little bit. And he knows who he is. I'm not going to say your name. Um, yeah, but the thing is this. Even let me let me be blunt. It's it's irrelevant if we if we turn um, someone's opinion or not, um, because at the end of the day, it takes the majority of us to to make a change. And unless the majority is going to do something, uh, we're all going down the toilet. And and this is really why we're so happy to reach so many people, right? Tens of thousands of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, as we as we have these broadcasts in the states, you know, in Australia, in, in the English speaking world, I would say. Uh, on you know English is quite a universal language these days, but guys, um, yes, it is. It is a victory to to make a, another person think a bit differently, maybe. Um, but to sustain that is really up to you. Like Dave and I, like Dave, you're not going to be with that dude forever, right? <laughs> so, so you met him at a party or whatever, you know, you hung up, hung out, and then for half an hour, hour, five hours, whatever it might have been, had a few beers, you know, chatted, and he goes, oh, that's interesting, Dave. Yeah. Tomorrow he might have gone, yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure, Dave. I had too many beers, and what you said doesn't make any sense because you are rattling the cage of his reality. Yeah, completely. And I, I talked about that with another person there. I said it's the it's the golden triangle. It's the tr- not not the Chinese, you know, um, Bermuda Triangle, but the golden triangle of um, going to work, going home, and going to the shops, which is your reality. Whatever that happens to be, that small triangle of you commuting to work, going home, and that's your fog of war. That's all you see in the world. And really, if that changes, your life is turned upside down. Yep. So I'm not trying to change that. I'm just saying, you know, like Flatlands, dudes, there's something different out there besides your little golden triangle. Have a look. I, if, you I, know, I want to burn you. I, I want to put you on a stake and burn you, crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the way it went down. Except I have to say, one lady came up to me. She says, "My son listens to your show. Um, he's." I started talk. I listened to one of your episodes. She said, and I started talking to him, and he thought I was the best person in the world. Really? Because I knew what I was talking about with DA14. Really? Yeah. So, so like, so that's the lady you went to school with, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of her sons. One of his sons came home going, you know what, I'm 15 and I know more than you. You know, DA14 is going to blah, blah, blah. And she goes, no, in, in fact, 
and she just shot him down. And she said, Leo, in fact, this is blah, 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 blah. And it was awesome. She said oh, that wow. her son had a new respect for her because she knew what she was talking about. Well, that's pretty funky. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was awesome, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Like, that's only what's one person. Let's just do this once a year. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, that, Let's do it great. every single show to 20,000 people, right? Uh, I'm with that. Um, so just, just um, a news flash. There's a massive storm rolling into where I live. I can hear the thunder in the distance. Mm-hmm. I'm watching on the radar right now, actually. Oh, okay, you can hear. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, so, so if, if there are any transmission uh, uh, issues, guys, just bear with us. Uh, it's probably just me that's going to be blank out. Uh, Dave will still be around. But yeah, just to warn you, fair warning, there's a massive storm coming my way. Um, in fact, um, this is just a topical thing. We had um, a, a thousand kilometer wide storm, like the U.S. superstorm, except mm. it didn't. It happened in midsummer, so there was no icing effect, and uh, we had ten meter waves, uh, you know, um, on the coastline, washed away most of the beaches. That's all in the last week. And last night, I was driving home, and I encountered around about a foot of water on the. Oh road. wow. I couldn't, I couldn't drive, and when the cars from the opposite direction went past me on the other side of the road, their mm. rooster tail of water made it impossible for me to see. And wow. I'm just lucky that I made it home um, intact. In fact, I saw a police car screaming down the freeway, um, it pro- it probably exceeding the speed limit, I can only estimate. And they were just about due to hit the puddle when they went out of my sight. So the wow. puddle was a foot deep by about 40 yards by 40 yards, right? That's pretty bad. Across on all three lanes. And they were about to, I don't know what happened to them, but I'm only going to guess that they would have um, uh, come to some, you know, grievous body in the arm kind of <laughs> negligent <laughs> driving the whole business, the poor thing. So, I mean, that was screaming under full full siren and lights too. So they had somewhere to go. Mm. Um, okay, I was going to, I just want to bring everyone's attention to, um, uh, I was watching, there's a, there was a, a band in the 80s and one of the keyboardists is actually a physicist and now he has his own show on cable TV about the universe and it, it's pretty cool. And in this show, he was bringing our attention to this thing, um, yeah. Mars, the red planet, and how, you know, from 1972 onwards, there hasn't really been much photography that's come good yeah, we saw the face on Mars, the pyramids, Cydonia. All these names now are synonymous with Mars, right? The red mm. planet, the, you know, um, don't get me started about the impossibilities of the Curiosity rover, which he actually brought up on air. He said, this, this photo is impossible. And it was a self-portrait photo, high-definition p- photo of the rover, the Curiosity rover. And there was, he said, you couldn't, it can't be taken because there's no yeah, that's right, and they say on, I actually read the caption on, on the picture. It says uh, the you know it's it's taken from the extended telescope uh, uh, telescope arm or projecting whatever you know like some kind of antenna or, mm-hmm. or but but I don't know if there's a pole on on, on the rover like that. And not only that, there should be a there should be a, a shadow or there should be some kind of indication that there is a pole, right? Rather than a, a, a disembodied camera hovering several feet above the rover. Yeah, which is exactly. exactly what it looks like. <laughs> and and that it wasn't. It was very similar to that one. And I think it's just full CG. That's all I think. I think the whole thing is full CG, and we'll never know the truth behind it. But but anyway, what they've done is they've. I think it was not the Cassini, but there was one of the um, uh, the satellites that's orbiting around Mars um, has provided something like two and a half million high definition photos of one meter. Um, uh, resolution, mm-hmm. right? and all of these photos are available now for us to look at, unedited, right, in full high definition on this website. I'm going to paste this into the chat room, and I because I want everyone to be aware of this. Um, hang on a sec. You just need to register, and then you can start drawing on it on the photos, um, and you can say whether it's a fan or a spider or, or some kind of artifact, and you can identify these, and you'll be known as the person who finds these items. So it's incredible, and because there's so many photos, it's impossible for them to have gone through it all, but they've downloaded and bought the whole chunk of it. Now it's available on this website. So, look, I urge you to go there. 
I found some images. Now, I'm going to paste into the chat room also our image gallery. I took a shot of some of the discussion photos. I've I've done, I don't know, 40 or 50 of them, and it's pretty fun. But I'm just going to put into our image gallery here uh, Mm -hmm. a link. Now, it's the first photo in the image gallery, and it... I have to say, after seeing 40 or 50 photos, I did a lot of fans, which are sort of like a black dust that gets blown up from underneath the sand like a geyser and is blown across the the sandy surface to make a fan shape. I've done about about 30 of those already and marked the fans so they know the orientation of the wind, etc. But these, there's two photos there. On the bottom left, a grey one and a, and a quite a really dark brown one, which have what looks like some kind of large plant with roots. Every one of them is completely different from the other. Uh-huh. And that's that's what I can all I can suggest to you. If I urge you to go to the chat room right now and and click on the shiny side out.net image gallery PHP. It's very interesting. All right. Now it, it is completely extraordinary. This could be... Um, and, oh, and by the res- with the resolution, is if it's one pixel equals one meter, uh, we're looking at, you know, maybe a three-kilometer wide plant. And they occur in a lot of places, and they don't overlap. So they look like... Um, they're sort of a reminiscent of the roots of, of a large plant or an organism of some kind. It looks like it's, you know, it's subdermal, like it just goes under the under the surface a little bit, right? But it's basically sort of like the fungus you would find, um, a long-term fungus on a tree on the outside as a single organism rather than a, a community of, organize, of organisms. So I thought that was actually pretty good, and, and I've spent a lot of time in here um, analysing all the photographs from Mars. Now, now, this is topical for tonight's show. Because what's tonight's show, Mickey? Well, tonight uh, we're going to um, give you some um, odd, interesting, strange uh, cases of close encounters uh, with unidentified flying objects. But not only that, uh, as, as we scan through these, there are some startling um, similarities between some of these encounters. Um, and uh, there's a little intro I'm going to give you guys in a little moment. But uh, it's, it's, it's uh, certainly a very... Uh, UFO filled show, I should say. By UFO, I really mean uh, unidentified flying objects. Okay, not saying they're this, not saying they're that, all the other. All I'm saying is, well, they truly are unidentified. And as soon as you call them something, they cease being UFOs. I hope everybody's with me on that. Oh, <laughs> so. yeah. We, we know your stance, Becky. Hey, I was gonna, <laughs> I'm going to suggest that you should also listen to the testimony of the people um, inside the story that we're mentioning. Mm, um, because remember, these aren't our opinions of them. This is the you know the same thing that MUFON and you know all the different uh, UFO societies around the world over time um, have all been recording. They're all recording a very similar experience. Yes, correct. And this is the thing, right? It is it is the it is the um, correlation of information that uh, from seemingly unconnected, well, actually, I think actually unconnected people all over the world. Um, and it's, it's a very compelling story in my mind, to say the least. Oh, completely. Hey, do you want to, maybe we let's, should just kick on and just do yeah. the first one, yeah? Yeah. I want to I give quite a number of seemingly divergent subjects, okay? And this show today is a major milestone for Dave and I. We, we you know, we... 50, that's, that's a lot. Um, and as such, we would like to bring you a truly tinfoil head material, meaning what we're going to present to you is, is, is very controversial and uh, generally disbelieved by, by the lar- public at large, by governments, by whomever. Uh, bear with us, though. We're going to discuss some of the oddest items we've come across over the years uh, and in our research and specifically preparing for the show. So it's a fair warning. Um, uh, some of the material is, is a little um, uh, controversial and uh, even strange, but uh, bear with us. I think you will be entertained, hopefully enlightened, and uh, you may even uh, 
uh, learn something. <laughs> that would be, be good. And no, look, the, the topic of UFOs is one uh, which everyone has an opinion on, right? We all have an opinion on UFOs. Whatever it is, if you hear about UFOs, there's something in your mind that you want to say. From the strong believer to the condescending skeptic. And, um, but, but it's almost religious. It's almost dogmatic in our belief. Uh, some believe uh, UFOs are travelers from other, other planets, uh, dimensions, or even other times. Um, you know, anything is possible. And others believe them to be experimental military aircraft. I think Dave and I would agree uh, with all of them. We, we think that it's possible that the UFOs we encounter are, in fact, manifestations of all of these phenomena. And the stories below that we're going to present to you are from different countries and different eras to show that people have been reporting the same characteristics and attributes in uh, UFOs and extraterrestrials and so forth for decades and, and maybe even hundreds of years. Okay? Uh, we believe that in the future the existence of intelligent uh, extraterrestrial life at the very least in this universe will be uh, seen to be um, self-evident. Okay? People will uh, probably look back and laugh at the ignorance of the past uh, much in the same way as uh, people in the, in the olden days believed the Earth was flat, you know, the, the Earth was the center of the universe and the sun uh, revolved around the Earth, and all of those wonderful fallacies that just um, arose from a lack of information. The data also, also, also in, the last, in the last 20 years, we realized that animals have feelings. Yeah, it, well, exactly, right? In fact, your, your mental state can affect your, your plant's mental state. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they do respond. I mean, people say, you know, if you talk to plants and whatnot, that's a good thing. And they usually say, oh, that's because of the CO2 emissions in your breathing, la, la, la. Not only that. Not only that, but also because uh, they can sense your feelings. And they have feelings themselves. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a difference in the electromagnetic signature they emit. I don't know if you're familiar with Killian photography. We can probably talk about that in some other show. But we have certainly seen evidence for that particular effect, Dave. Right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Cool. And that the, the plants, just like on Avatar, the movie, they communicate to each other. Mm. Yep. yep. And, and just because we don't see it doesn't mean it don't happen, right, guys? <laughs> let's, let's remember all the things we don't see. And now, uh, Werner van Braun, whom we have um, belabored in the past, you know, when we spoke about the first nuclear explosions in the world, you know, and how he had become destroyer of worlds, he's got another beautiful quote for us. Uh, Here we which, go. Which we do, with which we can kick off this particular show. So, he said this. You must accept one of two basic premises. Either we are, in fact, alone in the universe, or we are not alone in the universe. Either way, the implications are staggering. I agree. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if we're not alone, that's astonishing. If we were alone, in my mind, that would be even more astonishing and quite lonely. Right, Dave, shall we uh, dive into the... Um, Strange cases that we have. Uh, oh, please! Um, you put such a lot of work into this, and uh, uh, you, you know, after the show, you, well, when we post this up, you should have a look at the show notes. They're extraordinary. Today they're pretty good, yeah. But now again, uh, this is compiled information that is freely available to everybody. Okay, so all we're doing here for you guys is compiling information, maybe um, you know, editing it a bit, making it a bit more presentable. But the information is out there. Uh, the show notes today also include a few pictures, which you might find amusing and um, enlightening in some cases. Uh, and Dave, thank you very much for all the additions you, and, and edits you've actually made. So there's awesome stuff that uh, Dave has put in, some links as well. And so, so we're going to do, do this in a, in a, in a collaborative uh, fashion. I'll do one, Dave will do one, and yeah. uh, I think we're just going to ping pong it that way. <laughs> okay, so the first one is the Bowling Green Apparition. The Bowling Green Apparition. And now this took place in Devon, England. Um, uh, on the night of February 12, 2010, so which is uh, quite recent, uh, and the lifelong paranormal uh, skeptic Roy Shaw was walking his dog. Now he, he calls himself a skeptic. You know, we'll just take his word for it. And he was wandering through the quiet streets of his neighborhood um, uh, as he was uh, approaching uh, the uh, lawn bowling club. Uh, if in, in, in America, for you guys, uh, lawn bowling is something that older people play. It's, it's really on a lawn, you know, nice green. Uh, 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 garden and uh, or grass, I should say, and people uh, roll their balls across to hit another smaller ball. Um, that's all I know about it. The finer details escape me, but it looks like fun. And anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we're not old enough yet. Not not quite. Uh, but as he was approaching his local um, bowling club, lawn bowling, uh, he was startled by an odd object hovering high up in the sky. It was circular in shape. And it suspended itself above the bowling club, and Shaw 
enter the grounds to get a better look at uh, whatever this might be. He was astounded to make out a 100-foot-long spacecraft with blue and red lights streaming along its underside. At that point, a, a four-foot-high white apparition exited from the ship and flo uh, floated towards him across the lawn. So it was about four feet high, uh, you know, it's not very tall at all, and sem it seemed to be translucent, and it moved very slowly towards him. Uh, he was transfixed because it made a droning noise, which sounded like, my, 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 and repeated over and over. Uh, he later told the newspapers. Um, his dog, Sydney, uh, interesting, an animal um, he stated uh, was normally very placid, began growling and baring its teeth at the spirit, or the spirit-like form. At this point, Mr. Shaw ran for his life. With such haste, he twisted his ankle in the process. Uh, another dog walker in the area claims to have seen the ship dart off into the sky at a 45-degree angle. Funnily enough, though, Mr. Shaw still claims to be a paranormal skeptic, <laughs> even after his bizarre encounter. So, uh, no, this, this was reported by him, but, interestingly enough, there was some corroboration uh, by another dog walker. Dog walking seems to be a profession. In um, England. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like the story for, you know, that the, the guy who is a skeptic still is, saw something that made him so afraid he had to run away. His yep. dog saw it and someone else saw it at the same time. Yep. But it also matches, let's just rate this, it, it, that it matches, you know, four foot high figure. Um, yep. An apparition uh, is is the using the you know um, that guy's terminology or spirit because he couldn't believe it could be anything else. Yep, I like it. Um, I'll go on with the next one. Um, Good idea. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this, is uh, this one's titled UFO with an accent. A woman telephoned the RAF uh, Widdisham in Suffolk, England. Um, which is the Royal Air Force in Suffolk in England, on November 21st, 1989, in a distressed manner to report an, in that an encounter she had the night before with a strange man in her area. At around 10.30 at night time, the woman was walking her dog, once again, another dog walker, <laughs> near a sports field when she was approached by a man with a Scandinavian-type accent. I can't do one of those. I can do a Christopher Walken, but that's about that it. <laughs> and a poor French accent, too. Um, dressed in light brown overalls that resembled a flying suit. And we know what that is. Like, it's an all-in-one jumpsuit kind of thing. Mm. Um, a recently re released report from the National Archives about this case reads, he asked her if she was aware of stories about large, circular, flattened areas appearing in fields of wheat and then went on to explain that he was from another planet similar to Earth and that the circles have been caused by others like him who had travelled to Earth. Uh, the man went on um, that their visits were friendly but was ordered not to take, uh, sorry, not to make contact in case they were seen as a threat. That sounds consistent too. He said um, he disobeyed his orders. <laughs> Good on you. Rebel. <laughs> Revel, and felt it was important for contact between the people um, for this to occur. So I, I swear I'd be such a nice guy. If we went somewhere, I'd probably do the same thing. Um, the MOD, which is the uh, Ministry of Defence in England, notes the attached uh, notes attached to the file describe the case as one of our more unusual UFO reports. The operator who took the woman's call described it as a genuine call. Interesting. And again, a dog walker, and you're, excuse me, you're quite right. This seems to be a Nordic uh, that she encountered. Um, mm -hmm. For those guys uh, out there that know what that means, you know, there's specific encounters that have all been classified. And a, and a common one, or not that common, but quite common, is, is the Nordic type, you know, tall, blonde uh, um, visitors. And uh, yeah, look, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> yes, I. And, and, yeah, again, it's at night. It's near sports grounds. So usually sports grounds are in fairly deserted areas, not necessarily here, though I don't know the area. Uh, interesting, though, very interesting. Which brings us to the next case, which is quite strange um, and, and really out there. This is called the Wyoming case, Wyoming, uh, United States. So in 1974, Carl Higdon was hunting in Medicine Bow National Forest in Wyoming. Uh, he was taking aim and fired at an elk 
and something strange happened. His bullets seemed to move in slow motion. And this is something that, that we've come across now in a number of things, and you will, I will point them out here as we go along, as will Dave. As he went to retrieve his bullet, a sudden strange feeling came over him. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of these experiences that people have is accompanied with a certain emotional state or feeling they get. Mm -hmm. so, like almost like a supernatural uh, uh, premonition, if you will. Yeah. And turning around, he saw a human uh, humanoid over six feet tall, uh, which he described as having a black jumpsuit, a white belt decorated with a six-pointed star, and emblem of yellow. It had straight hair standing out from his, uh, his head, no eyebrows, uh, bow legs, and long arms ending with rod-like appendages instead of hands. So, um... You know, almost like a, like, a, like a corn hand, if you will. Uh, and this is the strange thing. Uh, the, the being asked him if he was hungry and gave him four pills, telling him if he ate one of them, he wouldn't be hungry for four days. Now, remember these pills, okay? So this being gave him four pills and he ate one. Uh, the humanoid uh, then pointed to him and in an instant he found himself encased in a transparent device and wearing a helmet. Two more humanoids appeared, carrying the five elk Higdon had previously hunted. Now, elk are huge. <laughs> they are big. They are bigger than cows. Now, they must be fairly strong and large to carry five elk. Be that as it may. And now, these elk were now stiff and in, un in an unnaturally frozen state. He was told he was going uh, to their home planet some 163,000 light years away and subsequently arrived there in a flash. Some kind of teleportation, I would imagine. Uh, on the planet, he said, there were many buildings that resembled the Seattle Space Needle, and the planet's sun was of an intense heat. Um, his next memory was of being back in Medicine Bow Park, in, in the National Forest there, with two and a half hours having elapsed. He staggered in a deranged state, unable to find his truck, eventually finding it three miles away. He radioed the sheriff, who found him at midnight, exhausted and frantic, and shouting, they took my elk. <laughs> now, this is, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. After being taken to the local hospital and being examined, they found all of his vitamin levels were miraculously high, and tuberculosis marks he had had on his lungs had vanished. Wow. Okay? Tuberculosis leaves scarring on your scarring tissue on your lungs. Yep, gone. Higdon's wife and two other people, now this is the corporation, in the area saw green and red lights in the sky on the night of his abduction. Okay, so there's, there's, there's certainly a, a corroboration of a strange lights in the sky, which is quite common as well. Interesting. Very yeah, interesting. That's, that's awesome. I love that. Um, I've got something at the, or right at the end of the show I'll, I'll tell you about as well. Um, mm. The Western France case. There's a beautiful picture of a field here. Like it looks like a, a winery. It looks lovely. Uh, George Gatte, or George Gatte, um, <laughs> was a well-respected uh, local man in the town of uh, Notre in western France. On the 30th of September 1954, now we're going back in time here, he was in charge of an eight-man crew working on a construction site. Whilst working, he felt a peculiar drowsiness came over him. Remember, these are feelings and emotions in connection to physical um, feelings, yeah? Um, yep. He felt compelled to walk, although he did not know where or why, as if someone or some unknown force was guiding him. When he stopped, he was in sight of an unknown being some 30 feet away in a hill. He described it as having an opaque glass helmet grey overalls and short boots. He also noted, so noticed a rod-like weapon in, his, in its hand and a square-shaped electronic device on his chest. The creature stood in front of a dome-shaped object which hovered three feet above the ground. It sounds like a craft. Oh, the craft also had a cupola shape on top, uh, like a dome. Uh, with blade-like devices protruding from its highest point. Could be aerials. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have had aerials. I suppose they would have been 54. Um, as he gazed in amazement, something even stranger happened. He stated, suddenly the strange man vanished. I couldn't explain how he did it, since he did not disappear from my field of vision by walking away, but vanished like an image one erases. 
happened. So he like beamed up or, you know, went out of phase or something. I don't know how to explain it. Neither does he. <laughs> then I heard, this is the uh, George Gatte, George, um, said, uh, then I heard a strong whistling sound which drowned the noise of our excavators. Now, you know, they make up to 60 dB. Mm. Um, soon the object rose by successive jerks in a vertical direction and then it too was erased in sort of a blue haze as if by a miracle, probably like a, a cloak or something like that. Gatte, different spelling, <laughs> then ran back to the site <laughs> to report what he saw and noted that at his first attempt to do so, he was overcome by an unshakable feeling of stillness. After greeting his workers with a panicky, have you seen something? Two of his workers concurred with his account, claiming to have seen a flying saucer and a man dressed like a diver in front of it. Mm -hmm. That's that, the description. That, yeah, completely corroborates, yeah? Um, remember, in those days, there wasn't scuba, right? Scuba hadn't been invented yet, so, you know, the diving bell helmet and everything still existed. Um, his seven co-workers complained of feeling inexplicably drowsy during the event, and George Gatte, or George, and himself suffered headaches, loss of appetite, insomnia for the full following week. Interesting. So again, it's some kind of funny feeling, right? And, and then a, a disappearance and out of, a phasing out, if you will, like Dave said, of whoever, whatever was there. Um, and we're going to encounter this as we go along even more. Um, it's, it's, it, this is where I think we are looking at different phenomena. We're looking at different encounters with different kind of... Properties. Uh, yeah, and yeah, absolutely different people. So there, there may very well be dimensional time or extraterrestrial travelers here, right? Different and technologies. Fact, yeah, it seems that way, right? I agree, 100%. Um, okay, so um, next we have the uh, Westall. We Westall, and you can do. I'll, I'll do that one. I'll do the Westall UFO encounter. Now that that occurred on April 6, nineteen sixty six, and this was in Melbourne, Victoria, in Australia. Uh, around eleven a.m., for about twenty minutes, more than two hundred students and teachers at two Victorian state schools allegedly witnessed an unexplained flying object which descended into a nearby open wild grass field. The paddock was adjacent to a grove of pine trees in an area known as the Grange. It's now a nature reserve. According to reports, the object then ascended in a northwesterly direction over the suburb of Clayton South, uh, also Victoria, Australia. At approximately 11 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, April 6, 1966, the class of students and a teacher from Westall High School uh, were just completing sport on the main oval when an object described as being gray saucer shaped craft with a slight purple hue and being about twice the size of a family car was alleged to have been seen. So this is a slightly more detail here for you guys. Mm -hmm. Witness descriptions were mixed. Andrew Greenwood, a science teacher, told the Dandenong Journal, that's the real place Dandenong in case you think I'm making this up, um, at the time that he saw a silvery green disc. According to witnesses, the object was descending and then crossed and overflew the high school's southwest west corner, going in a southeasterly direction, before disappearing from sight as it descended behind a stand of trees and into the paddock uh, uh, that's called the Grange, as, as we uh, discussed earlier. After a short period, again 20 minutes, the object, uh, with witnesses now uh, numbering over 200, then climbed at speed and departed towards the northwest. As the object gained added altitude, some accounts describe it as having been pursued from the scene by five unidentified aircraft which circled the object. So this, this is like one of the classic cases, if you yeah, will. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to add to that, um, uh, that not only was it 200 school children who all collaborated the same story with the teachers and the science teacher, right, blowing his mind. Um, but afterwards, they were interviewed by Australia's government um, secret, secret society, like secret workers, yeah, like uh, equivalent of the FBI. Um, they, they remain, I think there's the federal police interviewed them at the time. That's who they were. Um, they were also told not to tell anyone about it. Um, and at the same time, 
one of the girls who had claimed contact, she there was a group of five or six of them that ran into the field, you know, helplessly ran out, jumped fences and got caught in barbed wire and, and ran uh, compelled to see what it was, got through a clearing only to discover that there were beings there and um, – one girl, for in, in, in like just for example, um, was never returned to school. The next day, oh, really? she, yeah, she didn't return to school, and the, the family and the girl have never been seen again. Oh wow! So um, it's come out for some thirty years later, and um, been you know uh, you know hit the media. They did a documentary on it, and it's it's Australia's biggest UFO sighting. Mm. And I've even I've even put the documentary clip there, so when you want to uh, see this, you can check it out. Um, the Winchester woman. This is the one I like. This one a lot. Um, it, no, no. It reminds me of the the lady who grasped my arm at a funeral recently. The same kind of not not with the the frills in the, in the picture there, but um, it could just be an older older version of her. Um, the local councillor for a Winchester. In Hampshire, England, Mr. Adrian Hicks was in the town centre on a busy Saturday afternoon during the early months of 2004. After having lunch in his local bar and purchasing a few books from the bookstore, he noticed something odd about a woman walking through the rural town's main street. They're normally called the high street. Um, Her clothes were somewhat unusual and everything about her didn't add up. The way she moved and a general demeanour gave off a strange impression, which singled her out from the crowd. He followed her with his eyes for a few moments and came to the incredible realisation that she wasn't looking at all human-like, but an extraterrestrial. It was staggering, he says. I'm not usually lost for words, but this day I was. He watched her for about nine minutes walking ahead of her twice and noticed a tutu-like piece of clothing around her waist and a thick head of bright blonde hair. She was a humanoid walking with a penguin-like gait. She had very large oval eyes and was twirling her hands in a circular motion. She seemed friendly and totally at ease with us. She wasn't scared. She was smiling and seemed to be enjoying herself amongst us. Uh, the wealthy. <laughs> um, Hicks was startled when she stopped seven foot away from him when he uttered, oh, I can't say this on air. No, you can't. Um, um, what on earth is that? <laughs> Under his breath. Um, she walked very slowly up the high street. See, I told you it was the high street. I remember she was very interested in the clock over Lloyd's Bank. She was taking it all in. So it looked like she was a visitor, never been there before in her entire life, walking along just like, oh, no one knows I'm strange, you know, mm-hmm. sort of like um, uh, with Mars attacks. Mm-hmm. You know, the, yeah, yeah, the, I think that, yeah, absolutely. That came to mind straight away, the odd walk, you know, the slender body in a, you know, a tight dress, blah, 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 whatever. Um He stated that several people noticed her without paying any extra attention and spotted some people taking pictures of her, though no pictures have ever surfaced. Hicks believes that the encounter is to do with a much larger alien presence in Winchester due to the secret U.S. and British operations at a nearby base. An orthopedic technician with over 35 years' experience, Hicks kept his encounter secret for five years in order to secure his place in the local government. Good on you. Um, revealing his story only after securing election as a Liberal Democrat council. And that's extraordinary. That's not the first politician to have done anything like this. And he spent £400 of his own money for an artist to perfect her image. He now lobbies for the government to come clean about its dealings with UFOs. Do you know what? That's, that's good. good on him. Isn't that amazing? Like, yeah, you've, you've got someone here who has had a very strange encounter yeah. with whatever yeah. and was prompted. And now this, this is actually it goes a long way to what, I guess, believing uh, that he believes what he saw was true. Mm-hmm. Because you don't go to all this effort, you know, and then, then reveal that the reason you did all this is to, you know, so let's, let's find out about the UFOs here. You, you enter politics for a very specific reason. 
And, and by the way, the drawing that he spent the 400 pounds on is part of our show notes. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can uh, have a look for yourself. looks very interesting. Now, again, this, 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 I believe, may very well also be an encounter, potentially, with a time traveler. But um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, she was humanoid, right? And with the penguin, like, I mean, who knows how we, how we develop in the future or the past, in fact. But uh, she may very, very well have been a visitor also. And, but, but apparently, she, she acting a little like a tourist, I think, and, and seemingly fascinated by our time measuring devices. Yeah, so, I um, think that's that's a good good thing to note. Hmm. It, it seems it seems. Look again, the, the, the detail in these stories I find uh, amazing. It's, it's it's the little things, you know. It's because mm -hmm. if you make up a lie, most people make up lies that are broad and not very specific, one dimensional. More, absolutely. Whereas, yeah, exactly. That's that's a very good uh, uh, analogy there. One dimensional. Um, whereas, if, if the truth usually is, is deep and multifaceted and quite broad. Right? No, it's not. It's not as as as, as glossed over and, and one dimensional as a lie. So that that to me is, is certainly going into the believable category. Um, the next case we have is the Silbury Hill case, again in England, and a fairly recent case during July 2009. And this was done. So this this case uh, was actually reported by an off-duty police sergeant who was driving along the uh, A4 motorway uh, during the early morning hours. At around 5 a.m., while he was passing Silsbury Hill, and that's an area that's long been uh, renowned for its uh, Druidic influences and Druid, Druid precedent, so there's actually a hill there, which is uh, attributed to the Druids, or it is believed that the Druids built this particular almost perfectly circular hill, and it's also uh, known for UFO sightings and other mystical happenings. And he noticed three exceptionally tall men standing in a field, examining a recently made crop circle. And again, the show notes um, have an aerial photograph uh, of the area, and you can see what the uh, actual area looked like, so, uh, so to speak. He noticed, again, they had shining blonde hair and were dressed in white coveralls with their hoods down, which reminded him of forensic detectives. He's a policeman, so obviously he looks for the closest analogy. Mm -hmm. Intrigued by such a bizarre spectacle, the sergeant parked his car and approached the men. From a distance of 400 yards, which is about 250 meters or 300 meters, Dave, yard, meter, anyway. The same uh, same. He, same, same, or 400 meters then. He shouted at them, but his attempts fell on deaf ears, and he was ignored. Upon entering the field, the three men became aware of his presence and simultaneously turned toward him before making off at a miraculous high speed heading south away from the hill. Hmm. He followed them for a few seconds, but realized he was no match for their pace and watched in awe as they strode off in superhuman strides. Now, listen carefully. After glancing away for a few seconds, or for a second even, the sergeant looked back in the men's direction to see that they had completely vanished. Okay, once again, it's this complete vanishing act that seems to be occurring. Walking back to his car, again, he felt something akin to a static electric, electricity echoing throughout the field. So, it's again, there's this strange feeling that people get. The crops began to ripple and sway in time with a crackle that was pulsing all around him, and he developed a massive headache. Again, headache. He got scared, and the noise was still around, but he got a really uneasy feeling and headed for the car. For the rest of the day, he had a pounding headache that he couldn't shift. He contacted his colleagues at Wilshire Police, and they released this statement. I'm going to read this to you. The police officer was apparently off duty when this happened, so we have no comment to make because it is personal and not a police matter. End of statement. <laughs> On the night following the sighting, residents of the area reported seeing an unmarked helicopter hovering for three hours over the field where the encounter allegedly took place. A sequence that has followed UFO and crop circle reports in the area with increasing frequency. The sergeant continues to remain anonymous. So this police officer gained nothing from reporting this. His name wasn't released, and I can tell you, being a police officer, he probably wouldn't want it to be released because people would laugh at him. But I, I'm going to tell you something. The the cost to have an aircraft uh, like a helicopter uh, launch or lift off is twenty thousand dollars. 
It oh, costs well. that because of the maintenance total per year. So okay. for them so to have this thing flying for three hours, hovering over the site, um, obviously with their you know full light shining down or whatever, whatever they were doing and whatever they're doing it for, they had some intention. And it, <laughs> it clearly doesn't match the police officer's statement, does it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the thing is, this again, the funny feeling. Okay, guys, the funny feeling, the headache, and the apparent disappearance into thin air. Mm-hmm. Okay, these things seem to be accompanying all of these stories. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, that's true. That's tr- it, it's not dissimilar to when you talk about the unusual flight characteristics of UFOs. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And here we're talking about the actual experience. So we're talking about the. So the, the second or third, um, you know, encounter level of, um, yeah. of visitors. So we've got the Zimbabwe encounter. Um, I like this because it parallels so closely the Westall encounter. Good point. It really does. Uh, and, but once again, there's, there's something unusual, which I'll bring up after this one. Um, on the 14th of September 1985, there had been reports of a UFO, sorry, of UFOs in the skies over Zimbabwe uh, in Africa. Two days later, in the private aerial elementary in Rua, 20 kilometers from the capital, Harare, 62 schoolchildren between the ages of 5 and 12 spotted a glowing ball in the sky during the school's morning break. They watched it as it hovered around, appearing and disappearing for a short while before it gradually descended to the ground before it landed about 100 feet away from the school in a bushy area, <clears throat> pardon me, off limits to the children. A small man standing around three foot tall with long black hair, large eyes and a slim neck excited uh, so exited the craft and began to walk t- towards the children. Um, excited me. <laughs> yeah, I, I just got scared to death because my daughter guy came up from behind and gave me a kiss right now. Oh, oh my, oh my hair's standing on my on end. Um, the school's teachers and staff were indoors attending a meeting at this point, which left the children unsupervised. Um, as he moved. As he moved in, sorry, as he moved in their direction, he suddenly disappeared in mid-step, re- reappearing on top of the craft, where he silently stared at the children for a few moments, before re-entering the ship and soaring off at an incredible speed. The only adult present in the playground was a parent running a tuck shop near the school's entrance, who the children descended upon in a stampede-like fashion to relate their extraordinary tale. The teacher's headmaster, Colin Mackey, contacted the now late Cynthia Hind, there's an interesting topic there, who in her, in her time was Africa's foremost UFO investigator. She interviewed the pupils and asked them to recreate drawings of what they saw. Around 35 sketches and drawings were produced, which were all strikingly similar in their depiction of the man and his ship. Upon interviewing the children, Hind became convinced of the story's authenticity. The conscious so the consensus was reached among the parents, school staff and Hindi sorry and Hind, um, that the pupils were in fact telling the truth and such a lie would be far too complex for children of a young age to conceive and uphold. The extension of this story, which I'll I'll discuss, is that um, during they filmed their interviews with the children and some of these have gone to, uh, I think, a Discovery uh, or National Geographic um, show. And you can, I've watched the, de- the documentary and, and the children say um, that without words and only by looking at me, and I knew they were looking at me at the time, they showed me everything and told us that we're destroying our planet and that we need to stop what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Each one of the children said the same thing. Now, no words were spoken. They all said just the words were in my head. Yep. He was telling me. I knew he was saying his words because they weren't mine and they were in my head. These are all the different things. And you know what? It's That's pretty awesome. So... 
can you see the similarities between that and the other one and the Westall? I think it's very clear, absolutely. And, and again, it, it, it's also the messages that seem to be given, not just with the Westall, but in, in generally in UFO encounters, that we seem to be um, destroying our planet and people seem to be concerned, or visitors seem to be concerned more than, than we are, in fact. But yeah, the, the, the Westall and the Zimbabwe encounter are certainly very interesting because it's just a shit. I mean, you can talk about uh, mass hallucinations as long as you want. Um, for me, it doesn't explain the detail in, in what is being seen. And, well, and, you I'm going to also tell you that the children that go to this school are, uh, aren't socially trained by television. They have no electricity. Yeah, that's right. They haven't seen movies. They're in an isolated community. Um, and let me say, you know, there's maybe one mobile phone and you have to charge it off the car, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So they're not, they're, not, um, they're not like the rest of us. They haven't seen all of the Hollywood films. They're not used to this. They don't know what a grey is. And yep. yet they describe the same person with large eyes and a slim neck. Yep. It's impossibly small for the head size. That's right. And they talk about telepathy. And they have the same shaped ship as we're all used to. Like, they, they've not grown up with this material that's not in their head, it's not in their psyche, they haven't been conditioned socially to accept it. They just went, wow, this is something new, I've never seen one of these before, wonder what it is, and they all have exactly the same story. Mm -hmm. and welcome back to Shiny Sound number 50 with... Dave. And Mackie. And we're coming to you for live from the Sydney studios, um, we're a small piece of the Pulse Eruption Radio on freedomsystems.com, and you can join us. You know, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, on air, in the chat room if you like. And Dave gave you the call number earlier. I don't think we were able to um, take any calls today. There's too much stuff here. And you can check out our website for up-to-date guest information, guest bios, and previous shows. Do remember to donate if you can. This is the listener-funded radio station. If you like the information you're getting here, if you find it interesting, entertaining, just worthwhile listening to, please donate because it does cost money to keep this service going. And we don't have any commercial ads, and Nighthawk doesn't get paid. So thank you very much if you can. Right, Dave. Strange UFO encounters. Um, that's what we're talking about. And it sure the next is. one, <laughs> it sure is. The next one we're going to talk about is actually a personal favorite of mine. And it's the Livingston case. And I'll tell you why it's a personal favorite after I tell you what it is. So on November 5th, uh, 1979, I was just 10 years old then, uh, Robert Taylor, a forester employed by the Livingston Development Corporation, left his house at 10.30 in the morning to check on some saplings he had planted at Detchment Law, which is like a secluded forested hill area just off the M8 motorway. So again, we're in England, guys. And accompanied by his dog, once again a dog, he parked his pickup truck at the beginning of a forest trail and proceeded the rest of the way on foot. Now, that's when he came upon a very strange thing. Suspended in midair was a silent and motionless spherical object which he recalled measuring around 20 feet across uh, by about 12 feet high. So, so, you know, twice as tall as a man and about, um, you know, um, three or four times as wide as a man is tall. Made of a material he likened to black sandpaper. A row of small circular windows ran around the center of the object. A ring also protruded along the same course as the windows, that is, sitting just below the portholes. Parts of the object were transparent and seemed to morph, which gave Taylor the impression the object was trying to make itself invisible, or at least had the capability to do so. As he went to walk around, or sorry, rather toward the object, two smaller spheres covered in metal rods, which reminded him of old Navy mines. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's like a big metal ball, and the actual rods protruding are the trigger mechanisms. Yeah. So it's almost like a porcupine ball. Mm -hmm. And now these balls, or you know, uh, spheres, ejected from the primary object and began to roll towards him. Attaching themselves to each of his trouser legs, they emitted an acrid, stifling smell which made him gag for air, and he eventually lost consciousness. He, aw he awoke to find himself face down in the grass with the UFO long gone and uh, his dog running around barking wildly. Again, we've got the dogs reacting very strongly to these kinds of phenomena. Attempting to summon the dog, he realized he had lost his voice and trying to rise to his feet, he came to the horrible realization he couldn't stand or walk. 
he stumbled and crawled and lurched home. Uh, sorry, to his car first. He drove the car into a ditch, right, because he was quite uh, uncoordinated at the time. And then he sort of stumbled home. And upon his arrival, his wife thought he had been assaulted as he stood standing in the doorway. Uh, his face was grazed, his trousers were badly torn, and his clothes were caked in mud. Remember, he couldn't really walk, so he crawled to his car. He drove his car into a ditch. He stumbled home through the forest, so he was in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quite a, a sorry state. She called the police, and an investigation revealed some very interesting facts. The section of land in which he encountered the UFO was covered in peculiar indentations, and none of which matched any forestry equipment or vehicles that uh, were being used um, you know, uh, on, on the um, on the property. So, so you know, some strange. And this is actually uh, some of the signs that you have in UFO encounters. You have some indentations of usually the landing gear of these things. They don't have depressed the grass or left some imprints on the mud. The tears on his trousers, though, were forensically tested and were discovered to have been pierced by an unknown implement with the nature of the tears determining that whatever tore his trousers had attempted to lift him in an upwards direction. Taylor never gained financially or in, other, in any other form from telling his story, uh, which never changed from when he, when he first came to light in the 70s up until his death in, at 89, uh, age of 89, in 2007. So for almost 40 years, 30 years, for almost 40 years, he didn't change his story and he never gained from it. However, and this is why I like it uh, very much, the Livingston case remains unsolved to this day and it is the only UFO case in the UK which has resulted in a criminal investigation. So something, something real happened here, right? Now, I'm not saying what it is because there's no corroboration from anyone else, but certainly there's no, I guess there's no benefit for Taylor to have lied about this in the, in the way he did. It made no sense for him to come up with this very elaborate story, if you will. I mean, if he had just driven his car in a ditch, well, you know, I drove my car in a ditch, you know, sorry, it happens. But it's, it's certainly a very, very interesting, interesting story, especially uh, the tears in his pants, which, which seemed to have been made by something that was trying to lift him up, potentially mm -hmm. into the sphere? I don't know. Who knows? Do you know Absolutely. what? It's not the only UFO sighting in the world, though. Uh, the Travis Walton case had a criminal investigation. Oh, at this Absolutely. No, this is one. Yeah. I, I know, but j solely in the UK. I, I'm yeah. bringing it home, sort of connecting it to the American listeners, yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, it, that's an extraordinary case, and certainly for England and the MOD um, you know, and the DOD, for that matter, um, for them to, you know, um, embark upon a criminal investigation means that there was something to it enough for them to warrant uh, checking it out further. Um, I, I like this one because it, it has the descriptions of things that are very vivid, um, also hovering off the ground. I like, I like everything about this this case it's just another one of those things if you if you, if you listen to um, the uh, disclosure project um, media conference and he says there's 52 known species and only one of those is a humanoid um, in but you can only imagine that if that's the case in reality that there's going to be varying technologies from here or there around the universe and if if each and each one of these cases doesn't have to be the same as the other with the same technology, mm -hmm. I like that about this too, that it opens it up. Um, Absolutely, it does really. You know, it opens it up to to the full understanding. And I think um, without without what's his name, I forget the, the guy's name. He leans forward into his microphone and said, "There's 52 species of of aliens that are visiting this planet at the moment." <laughs> Right, and they're all humanoid except for one. He said, which raises the case that we were created by them. Mm -hmm. You know, how can everyone be a humanoid looking? Um, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, no, this, this is great. This, this great. is my absolute favorite of all time because um, it raises more questions once again. Now, check mm -hmm. this out. This is the popsicle stick Viking boat from 2009 in the Netherlands. So. Um, I'm going to tell you just a bit about the guy first. So this is a 31 world record breaker and former Hollywood stuntman, Robert McDonald. Um, what he did, he started a brand new thing. When he was a child, for instance, um, he was blown up in a gas cylinder explosion at his family's house and he spent most of his 
um, childhood um, in hospital with serious burns being repaired. Um, and he didn't get very many visitors or Christmas. He was forgotten about his, you know, birthday, everything. And um, he took it upon himself once he'd done all these movies and become popular to just visit hospitals giving toys to children in hospital. That's, nice. that, that's an extraordinary person. He, yeah. He's, you know, self-made. He doesn't need to do anything. Made, he decided to go on a new adventure, and that was to build a Viking boat out of used ice cream sticks or we call them paddle pop sticks or uh, popsicle sticks. They're a wooden stick about maybe five inches long, rounded ends, very flat. Anyway, he, it took 5,000 students four years with 15 million popsicle sticks to build a 50-foot-long Viking ship replica. Seaworthy, right? Completely seaworthy, yeah, yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's... In fact, in fact, the engineers that were looking at the plans going, oh, you know, in, in the beginning, no way is it going to work, discovered it was, you know, more than 19 times stronger than the original <laughs> because it's laminated. Yeah, of course. Right? Laminated timber is, is much stronger than, than just pure timber. Um, and he earned also a place in the Guinness Book of World Records um, in 2005 because um, during the test – for floating um, in a, a homemade vessel, uh, it has to float for an hour and a half to to get in there. And then this one being the largest one, the largest recycled object on the planet as well. Mm. Um, okay, so that's the background. So Captain Robert McDonald appeared uh, recently, um, as I think back in 2009, um, on a radio show, and this is where I bumped into this story. Um, uh, I've got Dutch heritage, and I, I've I asked some of my relatives who knew exactly what this was because it was not filtered out by the Dutch media because it was in Dutch, um, but the Western societies were never told of this. All, you can, all you'll know about it is that he floated the boat out there and something happened, it broke, and that was the end of the story, whereas the continuation of the story is this. Um, he was uh, out in the shipping lanes um, with a bunch of students, like I think 20, 20 kids on board this vessel, um, going to go uh, to England and in the boat. And suddenly the ship became gr um, grounded and lifted out of the water uh, on an orange sphere, an orange glowing sphere, not a solid orange, but a glowing illuminated sphere. And the um, the a rescue ship that came to find him didn't notice the flare he'd set off, just that his ship was hovering out of the water, sitting atop this orange glowing sphere. Um, what happened afterwards, uh, his ship was towed back, the mast was broken, the electronics were fried, uh, all the things that, you know, EMF. Um, when he was returned back to shore, um, he was approached by the men in black who confiscated both the ship's log and all the documents on board um, to note the electronics were all uh, melted. And Captain McDonald was also later found to have an electronic implant and an undefinable cancer, un yeah, un undefinable cancer in his neck, which he ended up having surgically removed. Now, the... Um, the rescuing ship in the collaboration of this um, – oh, by the way, um, Captain McDonald said he was approached by these guys in jumpsuits who told him he can't tell anyone, and he just opened the doors to the media conference and told everybody, <laughs> uh, good on him, and that's probably why you know, he got the cancer and everything. So Dan Helder, he was the, um, the rescuing craft ship captain, um, he said he noticed that the ship that Robert was uh, was in difficulties in North Sea, um, and according to the Coast, Coast Guard spokesman, spokesperson, uh, McDonald was um, one of those. Uh, let me, I've got to try and read through this because it's it's a direct conversion from Dutch. It says McDonald's was was Wednesday with one of ice lolly made boat was going to England, but problems with the engines spinning. Um, and burst ship electronics um, and the helm and mast and sail was all broken. He said that the, the cargo ship noticed a glowing orange-looking um, fire that was under the captain's ship and 
then he warned the Coast Guard for an SOS on his behalf, and he went to his, his aid. But he said it was five feet above the ocean. Mm-hmm. So this, this you know, multiple-ton vessel... Anyway, it goes on, but Robert, in the interview, stated that the orange glow came from beneath the ship. When it left, it left in advance of two jet fighters that arced over the horizon in full sprint, and it left underwater as a USO. This orange light went back down underwater, dropping their ship to the water, and then fled underwater. He noticed a helicopter circling above, and when he got back, he no- uh, the only other thing that was notable was these, these odd men in black in black flight suits or jumpsuits with an orange orb on the epaulette and blue berets. So these these have been these same guys have been found around the world whenever um, you know that the public might be informed about um, the orange orbs, and they're the cleanup crew for it. Uh-huh. So they might be the liaisons on Earth. We don't know. We don't know. But okay. But the story from the from the rescuing captain matches the captain of the you know the, this Robert McDonald, and they corroborated and um, yeah. And he wasn't. He was told never to tell anyone about it. I think that's one of the most extraordinary things. I've also got all the links in the uh, the notes that which I urge you to to, um, to look through. And one of them, in fact, is the um, um, is the full transcript from Dutch. And you can do your own translation yourself on it. And in fact, he's he's got a group on Facebook, um, which is also noted in the story. And he's changed his life from helping children to try to bring to light the UFO cover-ups and conspiracies. And in fact, because of his experience with the USOs, um, what's the underwater object that's found at the bottom of that thing? It looks like the Millennium Falcon, Mickey? Ah, the North Sea. It was recent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah. essentially it was a very large object that was found in the North Sea between, uh, I guess, between England, to Denmark, and Germany. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, he was rung up. He was called by the people investigating this as the world's, you know, underwater object specialist, <laughs> or not. And he's off doing that. But the <laughs> judging by his... Go on. It's another guy whose life has changed, like the liberal Democrat. Yes. Yes. Right? Who's who went into politics as now is trying to get this all the information lifted. This guy was just a nice guy going around giving toys to kids. Mm-hmm. And now he's trying to uncover this orb, the orange orb sensation. In fact in his story, which is now it's gone off Facebook off YouTube. It doesn't exist, so all the links will, won't work. And I've actually asked the guy who performed the interview if I can have a copy of the audio. Um, uh, he said there's even one called the croissant, a croissant mm-hmm. of Florida, which is the size of a Walmart and is orange, and it's, it's always submerged. He said that if only, it's only ever poked its head out but come back down again, back under the water. And I think that you know, if, if there was one of those plausible origins of, of these these craft um, underwater you know it's what four fifths of the earth's surface is water it makes sense that you could completely disappear under there and have a whole civilization that we couldn't touch yeah not yeah. only that but but life has existed in the oceans for a lot longer yeah exactly. um, than than down the surface I just want to talk about the guy itself himself looking at his track record and the things he sets out to accomplish and it's no mean feat to build this popsicle Viking ship or get this organized. Um, I, I have high hopes that he can actually get far. What I have fear, though, is that he may be stopped because, you know, obviously he's ignored the advice of the black men, or the men in black, if you will. Yeah, you don't want to do that, whatever that takes, right? Don't. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned for his safety um, because, again, you're right, the, the YouTube... Um, there was, there, I remember the, the videos we looked at when it first happened, Dave, um, and they're gone. Yep. Um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And in fact, some of the websites as we're investigating these things, guys, uh, for the shows, not, not just today's show, but in general, um, things that I know existed in the past have now gone. They're okay. no longer there. You get a 503 error sometimes, you know? Yep. Log entries. 
I, yep. I was watching, I was looking for this guy's blog entry. But the reason why this one um, hits home with me, because I've actually seen an orange orb fly silently and under what appeared to be intelligent control through the sky less than, you know, it, between 100 and 200 metres away or 200 yards away from me at only about 100 yards off, off their ground, right? Mm -hmm. And it, and it seemed to be about 10 yards across, to be honest. And it moved so slowly that it, you know, about the speed of an ultralight. But because it was so close, it made no sound whatsoever, and it was going against the breeze. So it, and it, because it made no sound, it didn't make any sense to my brain. And I'm, you know, pretty physics orientated. I, it has to be physical. And I'm looking at it, going, you know, well, what is this thing? Anyway, it went over the headland and went down into the water, never to be seen again. It went into the ocean, people. It is clear to me, Dave, that you were hallucinating. Or, or <laughs> Thank you. You probably, you probably misidentified a weather balloon. You know, that so. was swamp gas. That's what it <laughs> was. <laughs> Trying to, a flock of low flying geese. <laughs> um, <laughs> with with uh, yeah. the gear on. <laughs> now, this, this is serious stuff, guys. This is, this is interesting. This is, uh, these, these are things you can follow up for yourselves. Maybe you've seen them yourself. If you have, let us know. Very interested in, in, in finding out what you think. Um, Please uh, let us know, um, which 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 brings us to to another very well publicized case. Not in the English speaking world, though, in the spe in the I guess in the, in the Portuguese speaking world or the Latin world more more than anything, uh, because it did happen in fact in Brazil. It's called the Vagina case, and uh, Vagina is the place, um, and uh, this happened on January 13, 1996. Um, NORAD, in fact, tracked an uncorrelated, meaning a, a non-registered, unidentified object soaring above the Western Hemisphere on that day. It entered Brazilian airspace, and the uh, Kindacta, which is the Integrated Air Traffic Control and Air Defense Center in Brazil, was contacted by NORAD, who in turn alerted the Brazilian Army Command, address uh, Cocacos. Okay, and I do uh, apologize for the mispronunciation uh, of all of these words. Uh, and uh, it was given the instruction that all wings of the Brazilian military were to be put on high alert. Now, uh, wings refers to um, fixed and uh, variable, um, uh, um, non-fixed uh, uh, wing aircraft. So all aircraft were put on high alert in Brazil. Um, the rumors of uh, mass UFO sightings began sweeping uh, throughout southern Brazil in the days that followed. And events made a significant development on the 20th of January, some seven days later, when witnesses in a rural town in the state of Minas Gerais reported seeing a submarine-shaped craft cruising 20 feet above the ground, which appeared to be damaged or malfunctioning. It eventually, um, I guess, crashed, more or less. And at daybreak on the 21st of January, strange creatures were seen wandering around the town in an incapacitated and horribly confused state. Now, this is the description of the villagers. Um, the villagers erupted into frenzy and notified the police and fire brigade, telling them the town had been overrun by monsters from indigenous folk tales and even the devil himself. Remember, people will cling to the closest analogy they can comprehend. Tales of demons and devils and chupacabra and all of that are coming to mind naturally, when you confront something you can't easily explain. The army was quickly contacted, and according to several witnesses, two of the creatures were captured without resistance, with one being subsequently shot dead and the other being transferred to the hospital Humanitas uh, to receive treatment for the injuries it sustained during the crash. So they kill one and they fix one. It's a little strange. Um, the orthopedic surgeon Lair, that's his name, L-E-I-R, uh, -E interviewed when he was interviewed, said he was instructed by armed officers to begin a surgical scrub and prepare to form a fracture reduction on what was obviously a leg. Uh, um, Lear then went to interview the other surgeons and assistants that attended the surgery, who all stated the operating theater was sealed except for one entrance, which was manned by armed officers who were unaware of what was in the theater. The flow of military officials and hospital personnel into the room was strictly monitored, with only a small essential team of staff being allowed inside. Corrective surgery was performed on a fracture of the femur of its upper thigh, 
with members of the Brazilian army as two military intelligence division being present at the surgery. So obviously the creature had some kind of femur in its upper thigh, so it's, it's quite humanoid, of course. The bipedal creature was described as being around five feet tall with massive red eyes, a thin neck, and dark brown skin, which looked wet, but was dry to the touch. It also had three bony protuberances on three sections across its head. So almost like fins, if you will, on top of the head, or ridges. And from its anatomy alone, its sex was indeterminable. All attempts made to communicate verbally with the creature were of no consequence, and its wound completely healed within 24 hours. After surgery, the surgeon turned uh, to see the uh, alien eyes fixated upon him. He then began to feel hammer-like hammer blows to his head, and chunks of information began to pound and cram into his mind, which he described as being like thought grams. So it looks like some very crude, well, crude maybe because we're not equipped for it, a form of telepathy. Okay, so the information was really rammed down into his brain. Interestingly enough, the surgeon never revealed the full extent of what the alien told him. But among other things, it told him that its race felt sorry for humans because we are largely detached from our spiritual selves and are unaware of the amazing things we can accomplish, uh, which its own race already had. Okay, again, it's, 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 it's this uh, concern that other creatures, visitors, have for us for some reason. Two days later, several witnesses saw U.S. military cargo planes land at Sao Paulo Airport, uh, which um, was presumed to collect the crashed craft and its occupants. That's a fair assumption. Uh, the story was picked up in its most basic form by the Wall Street Journal, who ran it on the front page as a story as centrally dealing with the downed unknown object in Brazil. Uh, Ubi Rayara Rodriguez, uh, an attorney in Vagina of a UFO case expert obtained a copy of the death certificate of a Corporal Marco Cheres, an officer who died three weeks after he supposedly touched the creature with his bare hands. His death certificate states the cause of death is being from a toxic substance and an Ebola type disease, mm. although the full report of his autopsy has never been revealed. Interesting. Again, not entirely unbelievable because, you know, as soon as two un if, uh, un unknown cultures meet each other, diseases are usually what uh, wipes one of the other out. Spanish and the South Americans. 100%. Smallpox. Yep. Now, this is where it gets interesting. In the weeks that followed the event, and you can look this up for yourselves and do your own research, a surprise visit was paid to Brazil by Warren Christopher and Daniel S. Golden. Now, who were those guys? Now, those guys were, at the time, the U.S. Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, and the Director of NASA, Daniel S. Golden. No way, really. Way, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. And now Lair, the, the surgeon, was shown several authenticated documents concerning agreements between Brazil and America which allow any material coming from space that is found in Brazil to be turned over to the government of the United States. Hmm. Really, that's an interesting agreement. In, in turn for some, you know, uh, money that they've paid them. Yes. Oh, I'm sure that's, that's true. <laughs> to... To top it off, there are literally hundreds of witnesses across Vagina from all walks of life who can attest to these events having taken place. So there are police officers, school teachers, peasant farmers, and government employees. They're all united under the belief that extraterrestrials crash landed, crash landed in their city uh, at the turn of 1996, and they all witnessed it with their own eyes. Now, this next part I love, and, and please do listen carefully. The official explanation that Major Eduardo Calza of the Brazilian military gave us the cause of all of this UFO hysteria surrounding Vargina was this, and I'm quoting, it was an expected dwarf couple and a mentally handicapped dwarf, he told investigative journalist Bruce Burgess during an interview for his documentary, The Brazilian Roswell. Hmm. So it was three, three dwarfs, one of them mentally handicapped. And the other one was pregnant. Correct. Okay, that's the official explanation. Make of this what you will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, deep, or buried deep within inside the US, mil uh, U.S. military's own records are also bizarre and very well-documented cases, which we're going to go through with you now. So this, this comes from uh, the U.S. military's own records here. Uh, okay. Dave, if you <laughs> yeah. Okay, the Chiles Witted. Is it Chiles Witted? 
Yeah, I think Shields put it. Yeah, I think okay, so. the Shields put UFO encounter, named after a commercial airline. Uh, sorry, named after commercial airline pilots of World War II veterans, Charles, uh, Clarence Childs and Charles Witted. The sighting of this sighting occurred in the wee hours of July 24, 1948, when both Childs and co-pilot co-pilot Witted um, reported having to evade a UFO. The unsettling evidence. The fact that, so the below facts are from the Air Force's own investigation into the sighting. Both men claimed that they got a good long 10 to 15 seconds look at it. And if you think it's because both men had been dropping the same (laughs) as minutes earlier, um, know that one of the passengers in the plane One of the few who were awake at the time also saw it. Everyone involved described it as a rocket-like ship, conical in shape with two decks lined with windows, which produced an almost blinding light from beneath the ship. The pilots got on the radio, trying not to sound crazy. Crazy! (laughs) Um, I can't help it, the trigger word. Um, asked if there were any experimental craft in the area, which is their normal procedure. Uh, there weren't, or at least none that flight control knew about. The Air Force investigators started poking around. They found yet another witness on the ground, a guy named Walter Massey, who worked as a member of the ground crew at a nearby, nearby Air Force base who claimed to have seen the same object. Okay, so now we have a military-trained Air Force Air Force observer having seen this, reporting it an hour before Charles and Witted. Wow, so we saw it before they did. Then, strangest of all, they found out that the same object right down to the two rows of windows was spotted in the Netherlands. Well, they probably just heard about the Charles Witted sighting and wanted to, to jump on the bandwagon, right? Well, only if they had time had time machine. It was reported a month earlier. Boom. Wow. So the official explanation. Firstly, the military dismissed the Charles Witted encounter as a weather balloon. <laughs> Good on you. Um, <laughs> but then they retracted that explanation, typical U.S. military, and floated the idea that it was a meteor. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've seen those recently, haven't we? Do, do they look like something you'd be able to see for 10 to 15 seconds and identify light and windows? Um the pilots flatly rejected this theory, both having seen meteors before and knowing that they tended to not have windows. I was exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> After investigating it, the Air Force famously concluded that it was, in fact, an alien spacecraft. After investigators handed in that report, supervisors handed it right back and with a proverbial um, crap stamped <laughs> on it in red. He's laughing because that's not what's actually written there. No, it's um, BS. <laughs> yes, BS. Um, they said it was BS. Um, they pointed out that just because we don't know what the object was doesn't mean it's little green men. Well, fair point. But in fact, but... what it means is, is it's an unidentified flying object. Yeah, but, but we all know they're probably tall, blonde, so <laughs> not little green. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, again, from, from the military's uh, own files, this mm-hmm. stuff is guys, okay? Uh, fascinating stuff. And, 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 you know, this is what happens, though, a lot, right, Dave? I mean, uh, oh, no, no, it was a meteor. Oh, no, no, it was a weather balloon. And, and this is, this is, um, because once you've classified and explained it, you don't have to think about it anymore. I'm astonished that the investigators actually handed it back saying, well, you know, we don't really know what it is. We think it may very well be an alien spacecraft. What do you think about that? And the supervisor goes, no. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, we don't have that explanation. Sorry. Yeah, we, we, we don't live in that world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's what happens, guys. So, so that's how, how you normally don't hear about it, okay? Mm-hmm. Normally. And the next one is very interesting. Uh, in fact, this is um, uh, the green fireball sightings uh, that, that occurred in New Mexico between December 1948 and April 1955. And that was seen by hundreds of military scientists, astronomers, and enlisted personnel, along with, a num- uh, with, with uh, uh, members of the general public. This was in New Mexico. Okay? And I'm going to tell you where in New Mexico in a second. Uh, a, a rational person um, would you know, think, well, meteor, you know, maybe a comet. It's streaking across the sky. It's on fire. You know, it's, a, it's the sort of thing we would expect from time to time. Now, that's what the government thought as well. 
and they brought in a meteor expert uh, by the name of Dr. Lincoln La Paz, and the unsettling evidence unfolded thusly. La Paz spent years on the subject and decided that the rate in which the fireballs were being sighted, combined with the slow speeds and lack of rock bits trailing the objects, meant they weren't behaving in a matter fitting of meteors, mm-hmm. or that of any natural phenomenon, in fact. The Air Force... Uh, the Air Force investigation into these fireballs was named Project Twinkle. It's quite poetic. A, a lot of those sightings, this is where it gets interesting, were over Los Alamos National Laboratories, <laughs> which is the atom bomb construction site. Yeah. And many of the sightings were from staff working there. The government decided whether it was aliens or Russians or angels getting cast out heaven, they wanted to know what was going on. They wanted to get to the bottom of it. After a couple uh, years of looking into it, and this was uh, specifically by Dr. Lincoln La Paz, uh, they knew nothing more than when they started. They were balls, they were green, and they were on fire. Okay, so the investigation didn't really uh, uh, come... It didn't bring out any more information. Not, not really. And this is the official explanation. The Air Force shut down the investigation and finally wrote off the phenomenon as uh, sunspots or some uh, new kind of meteor or something, um, now, La Paz, the actual expert, insisted that none of that made sense and would continue to do so for years. The balls were spotted over and over again, even after the investigation shut down. And each time someone would go to interview uh, poor Dr. La Paz, who would repeat his long list of reasons why they're not meteors. La Paz thought they were some kind of radical new Soviet aircraft or something else that didn't just occur in nature. Another theory turned up later that maybe it was some weird effect caused by nuclear fallout. Uh, which would make sense considering where they were being spotted. But uh, glowing green balls of fallout isn't a known phenomenon either. Okay, so again, typical military uh, attitude as well. We can't explain it. It no longer exists. It doesn't concern us. And I don't care what Dr. La Paz says, who is the expert. It has to be some some kind of new meteor. He was trying. (laughs) You know, you could tell he was under duress, not to to give away too much. Um, uh, let's talk about in, in um, 1948. There was a the, the, what's called the Gorman dogfight in October 1st, 1948, in the skies over Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, great film that, by the way, Fargo. And if you can go and see it, see it, do yourself a favour. Um, World War II veteran and resident um, uh, uh, <laughs> Daredevil. I'm going to be- it, it's badass George <laughs> F. Gorman claimed he wound up in a game of chicken with a small blinking orb of light. And we know from World War II that the small blinking orbs of light were known as, what were they, Mickey, in World War II? Foo Fighters. Exactly, hence the band name. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, as he put it, a man-made craft that, while governed by the laws of inertia, was still able to not only outmaneuver his own aircraft, but climb at a much higher rate and remain active at much higher altitude, remembering the limitations of um, a propeller-driven aircraft in 1948. Um, So, yeah, there's a ceiling at which you can operate the plane. Uh, The unsettling evidence. As Air Force records show, along with Gorman's testimony, there were two other witnesses who were working in the airplane control tower. They saw the object, but nothing showed on their radar, and the pilot and passenger of yet another plane who happened to be in the area all saw it. Gorman claimed that he chased the object all around the sky, saying at one point it flew right for him, zipping overhead at the last minute, so playing chicken. Uh, Later he said it turned and flew towards him again before rapidly breaking off and changing direction. He briefly lost sight of the object, then found that it had climbed much higher in the sky. When he landed, somebody ran a Geiger counter over his plane and found slightly elevated levels of radiation. Because remember, in 1948, we were so concerned about everything had to be radioactive because that's what the new power was all about. Everything was about energy. At which point, everyone got really nervous, though investigators would later conclude that they may be normal for planes just returning from flight. Of course they would. Um, (laughs) Yeah, a new kind of meteor. Yes, it's normal that you get radioactive just flying through the air. Um, Clearly. Uh, since you're less shielded from natural radiation, the higher in the atmosphere you go. Now, that's actually true. Yes. 
The official explanation, though, however, um, the short answer is a weather balloon. <laughs> that old <laughs> chest, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, the long answer is that the Air Force decided that Gorman, a highly regarded fighter pilot and war world, so World War II veteran, had gotten really, really confused. <laughs> That's their explanation. Yeah. The theory was that he got disorientated while flying and the, re- the erratic movements he perceived the glowing UFO to be making were actually a result of him flying erratically himself causing the stationary weather balloon to appear to zip back and forth in his windshield. That's ridiculous. Oh, my goodness. When he lost sight of the UFO and picked it up later, the theory went that he actually was chasing the planet Jupiter. That makes perfect sense to me. (laughs) My head is in my hands. (laughs) Official explanation, guys. This is truly the official explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like the (laughs) X-Files, but the, the kids' version. It can't be anything but Jupiter and a confused pilot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, now, you're going to mention, mention one of my favorite historical ones, Mickey. Yeah, no, this is the Washington, D.C. UFO incident. And if I'm not mistaken, and I may be, the movie um, The Day the Earth Stood Still may have been based on this. Mm-hmm. I have to look at the production date for The Earth Stood Still. But essentially, between July 13 and July 29... In 1952, a series of UFO sightings were reported over Washington, D.C. And witnesses would include an Air Force pilot, people on the ground, and in case you're the type to never trust the testimony of fallible human beings, uh, we have readings from two separate radar stations as well. So this, these UFOs actually appeared on radar. Uh, the first substantiated report came on July 19 when air traffic controller Edward Nugent of uh, Washington National Airport, and I'm quoting here, noticed seven unidentifiable objects on his radar. The objects were not following established flight paths and, in typical UFO sighting fashion, were being too radical in their movements to be ordinary aircraft. Now imagine they're very fast and they can change direction very, very quickly. Meanwhile, at uh, Andrews Air Force Base, air traffic controllers were also tracking several unidentified objects. According to the military's report on the incident, both towers were tracking an object that was hovering over a radio beacon before it vanished from both radars at the exact same time. So maybe those objects wanted to be captured by the radar. I don't know. Even more interesting is that almost the exact same thing happened on July 26, only a week later. The same airports, the same radar readings, the same UFOs, all on the same day of the week. Exactly say, seven days later. Two fighter jets were sent this time, one of which saw nothing. The other, however, reported four orbs of light zipping around. The pilot even called in to ask if he should shoot them down or something before they streaked out of sight. And that was enough to attract the attention of President Harry Truman, president at the time. By now, the Air Force had la- launched Project Blue Book. I'm assuming most of you guys are familiar with that. A massive investigation to pretty much every UFO sighting ever with the goal of finding out once and for all what was going on. Now, this was the official explanation for this incident. <laughs> Pro- <laughs> Sorry, Project- I have to interject. And with the sole finding that, that nothing was real. Oh, no, no, it's, it's all made up. It's all yeah. hallucinations and such. <laughs> <laughs> so, Project Blue Book was headed by Air Force Captain Edward Ruppelt. And the best guess he could come up with for the DC sightings was that the radar was giving false readings due to a temperature inversion. Uh, What that is, is a layer of warm, moist air covers a layer of cool, dry air close to the ground, which can uh, reflect radar signals, so that that can happen, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, This didn't account for the eyewitness sightings, of course, or for the fact that temperature inversions are common, but radars never pick them up. (laughs) (laughs) So the government's official position wound up being that there was a meteor storm, or some other phenomena uh, at the exact same time. By pure coincidence, there was an unrelated uh, radar error causing the false signals. So you have a meteor storm, and by pure coincidence, at the same time, they've got a failure in the radar equipment. Mystery solved. Though we should point out that among the people who didn't buy the explanation included Rupert and the personnel. Yeah, that's right. And the personnel who were manning the radar stations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so again, we, we have this... Whatever it is that happens, okay, and I'm, I'm not saying what it is, but 
we have this deep need, or the US military has this deep need, to explain it away as something very mundane. Fair enough, I get that. But it just doesn't make any sense. If it made sense, I would go, hey, that okay, I can, I can, I can deal with it. But in this case, not even the person that came up with it believes it. You know? So come on, guys. Come up with some better explanations here. Yeah, but all I'm seeing is men in black, that little stick thing, little pen they put in front of you and go, poof. <laughs> and, and then they tell you it's swamp gas. The neuralizer. <laughs> That's right. I gotta get you one of those. Oh, um, gotta have Because one. clearly it, it works. These people Absolutely. are convinced that this is a great idea and a great ex- explanation for it. Absolutely. The, yeah, look, the next case is closer to home, Dave. Uh, very interesting to us in Australia, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this is the, the Valentich disappearance. History has seen its fair share of aircraft and even boats disappearing into the grey abyss that is our mighty oceans. I love this. <laughs> Whoever wrote this is great. So it wouldn't be surprising to hear that on October 21st, 1978, a Cessna 182 light aircraft piloted by Australian Frederick Valentich disappeared right out of thin air. I love that description. Uh, we use it a lot. That is, until one takes into account his final radio transmissions. This is the unsettling evidence. In his final words with the Melbourne Air Traffic Control, Valentich described being followed by a UFO. Um, you do Melbourne, you do, the, you do the traffic tower and I'll do the, the guy, right? Okay. Okay. Do you like that? I love it. <laughs> Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000? No known traffic. I am... Seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. What type of aircraft is it? I cannot confirm. It it is four bright. It seems to be, it seems to me like landing lights. Now, he was describing something. He says, like Gorman, Valentich claimed the aircraft was intentionally buzzing him, zipping past, getting too close and going incredibly fast. At one point, Valentich said the aircraft stopped in midair and he orbited around it to get a good look. So it was inviting him, playing with him, saying, hey, hey, I'm here, check us out. Then Valentich goes on to say, in, on, over the airwaves, he says, it's got a green light and sort of metallic, like it's all shiny on the outside. It just vanished. And then later, along the recording, he says, uh, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. Two seconds of open microphone of no no sound at all, and he goes, it's hovering over. It's not an aircraft. So this is a, a, a good pilot. You know, he knows what he's doing. He's flown this before. Um, I think he was going to go down and buy some apples. I think that's what he was doing. He's actually flying to Tasmania to buy apples for his parents. Mm-hmm. Um, Those were Valencia's last words to air traffic control and maybe his last words to anyone. What followed was 17 seconds of a metallic scraping sound. Neither Valencia nor his plane were ever seen again. The investigation has been one long, frustrating dead end. No wreckage of the plane has been found, and despite there being a huge air sea rescue search for him. um, But he was close enough to the ocean that he could have wound up crashing there. So the official explanation, I love this, this is what's actually happened. And one of the cruel realities of life is that it's pretty easy to blame whoever isn't around to defend themselves. So Valentich was crazy, crazy, <laughs> stupid, <laughs> disorientated, um, immediately becomes the default explanation. For instance, some have suggested Valentich became disorientated and was actually flying upside down the entire time. I think you might notice <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the lights he saw being his own in the reflection in the ocean. What a complete <laughs> load, right? Hey, <laughs> you, have to have a, you have to placebo effect, huh? Something, man, <laughs> okay? Something. Give it a name. Give it a name. Oh. Huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, this yeah. is just crazy. Um, oh, I know. Yeah, g- go on with the crash land landrum incident, yeah? I will, I will. And to the to the uh, to the chat room, no, that was in 1985. The Zimbabwe incident, mm-hmm. the tones, 1985. Uh, yeah, the the next one is interesting. Um, involves two ladies. Um, it's it's called the uh, Cash 
Landrum incident. On December 29, 1980, Betty Cash, uh, Vicky Landrum, and Colby Landrum, uh, which is uh, Vicky's seven-year-old grandson, were driving home to Dayton and Texas. Text! Uh, it was 9 p.m. when a bright light in the trees above them forced them to stop the vehicle. They got out of the car to inspect, and Vicky, a devout Christian, believing that it was the second coming of Jesus, um, uh, so <laughs> they noticed, I'm sorry, they noticed the object emitting the light that was shaped like a diamond before suddenly they were hit with an intense blast of heat. Okay? So they, the lady who was a devout Christian believed it was the second coming of Christ. Don't think so. However, they were hit with an intense blast of heat. The mystery object vanished, leaving the women suffering severe radiation burns, nausea, and diarrhea. They would continue to suffer from the same symptoms plus excruciating headaches on the same date every year. I actually remember this one, Mickey. Yep. They were driving uh, along a forested road and it came into sight, hovered over the diamond shaped, um, put a blast of light and heat over their vehicle and then yep. left. Now, um, these, these, are, these are physically, I mean, you don't get radiation burns by just going out into the sun. Okay, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> or, or by witnessing a meteor streaking through the sky. Correct. Or so a helicopter, a, for that matter. Off. Any, yeah, absolutely. So th this, is, this is tangible. This is, uh, th these, these women had severe radiation burns. And what I find interesting is, like stigmata, these symptoms would occur uh, for, for, for many years on the same date every year afterwards, mm -hmm. plus the headaches. I think we've mentioned the headaches many times before, right? Yeah, so, so far. It's a running theme through this Absolutely. as well. So some, so, mm. Yeah, completely. Uh, I've actually seen those ladies interviewed with the grandson um, way back uh, when, when it occurred, yeah? Okay. Um, on, on TV. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, Chupacabra. I love this one. Um, around April 2000 in Chile... Um, was supposed surrounded by a paranormal. I should start again. Around April 2000, Chile was sur surrounded by paranormal activity. There were several UFO sightings, including one case which saw police chase after a set of strange lights, believing them to be signals from a secret landing strip, looking for drug runners or something like that. No doubt. Yep, yep. Um, all they found though was a weird triangular burn mark on the ground. At the same time as the sightings there were also reports of unexplainable howls in the night and the slaying of at least 30 animals, which included pigs, dogs and ducks, all killed in the same way, completely drained of blood. These were put down to the legendary chupacabra or goat sucker as the chupacabra and... Sorry, is the chupacabra an alien creature surviving in Chile or a new breed of genetic, genetically mutated animal? And the, we've seen pictures of the chupacabra now on, on the net as well, mm -hmm. in, in, in some documentaries. So it's, it, it really is, it looks like a, not like a dog, the, with massive jaws, and it's got funny shaped body. It's, 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 I don't know, it looks like a very strange animal. Yeah, completely. You know, it's, it's, it's very odd, and, and you can look that up for yourselves, you guys, um, and have a look. Um, Maybe it was a pet of one of the visitors, and they <laughs> left it here by mistake. Hey, Go, absolutely. pet boy! Yeah. They quickly close the doors and stream away. <laughs> they fetched everything. <laughs> it's like the... <laughs> it, you know what? The, the, I don't know if you guys watch um, Futurama, but there's this little alien that, that Leela has that eats everything, right? And, and the, 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 God, the Chupacabra looks a bit like that, <laughs> you know? Um, now, uh, the next one we have, we have actually dealt with in, into some detail, um, uh, the Kecksburg UFO incident. And uh, we've, we've linked that particular incident with the Nazi bell, if you remember, and asked the question of whether or not maybe this was one of the Nazi bells that, that was flung through time and space. Who knows? However, to, to quickly uh, cover this, uh, very similar to the Roswell incident, which we haven't actually listed here because I think everybody should be familiar with the Roswell crash, mm -hmm. uh, in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, in 1965, uh, uh, was apparently the location of a spectacular UFO crash. Uh, subsequently, there was a cover-up uh, of, the, of the event. I in December that year, there were sightings of a fireball that streaked across the sky over Michigan and northern Ohio. Sonic booms could then be heard around Pennsylvania, which resulted in the object scattering hot debris that caused grass fires before finally crashing in the woods. What was found was an acorn-shaped object that was the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and reportedly had what looked like Egyptian hieroglyphics around its midsection. 
Now, if you're familiar with the Nazi bell, that's what it looked like mm -hmm. very, very much. Best uh, description. Absolutely. And apparently, the U.S. Army soon showed up, took the thing away, and remained tight-lipped over the whole incident ever since. So we don't know. We, we have no further information on that. And we are fast running out of time.